Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Oh God, today's case. Um, oh my God, I have no words. Literally I have no words. There's so many times I have no words, but this case, wow, wow, wow. Today we are going to be covering the case of Taylor Parker. Oh, this woman, mm -mm, she's evil, pure evil. If you look up evil in the dictionary, you will see a picture of Taylor Parker. Taylor basically lived in a fantasy world that she had made up and she lied and manipulated every single person around her. She tried to take advantage of every single person around her. And she was just one of those people that you never knew if what she was saying was the truth or just the biggest lie you've ever heard. You didn't get birth this morning. What do you what do you mean? I just told y'all what happened. And she pulled so many innocent people into her web of lies. And I need to warn you about today's case. It is crazy. It's uh, it's on another level. And it's also so confusing at times. Taylor's lies were so absurd and so extreme that there will be times in this video where you'll be thinking, what? is going on. Because I had that same thought many times during my research. A boy or a girl? A girl. A girl. Did you have a name? Again. And then tragically, after Taylor had manipulated and lied to every single person around her for years, Taylor befriended a young pregnant woman called Reagan Hancock. And Reagan was one of the nicest people you would ever meet, but she was pulled into the sick and twisted world of Taylor. And the consequences of this case are just absolutely devastating devastating because Taylor committed one of the most horrific crimes imaginable. So prepare yourselves for today's case and let's dive in. I just want to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor and that is Mooncat. So you guys know by now how much I absolutely love nail polish. Every single one of my true crime and makeup videos, I try and match my nails to my makeup. And I know a lot of you guys look out for that. And I've been painting my own nails for the longest time. It is something that I just love doing. And one of my favorite nail polish brands right now is Mooncat. And they reached out to me because I was wearing one of their nail polishes in a recent video and I literally screamed when I got the email like I could not believe it and the thing that I love the most about Mooncat nail polishes is that they're so unique like truly Mooncat's nail polishes are out of this world I always go to Mooncat when I want a unique shade when I want a more unusual shade because truly the nail polishes that you find at Mooncat you cannot find them anywhere else they have the most beautiful colors the most beautiful formula the most unique formulas and all of their products are 100% vegan and cruelty free. Their nail polishes are also 10 free and they are designed and crafted in the USA. They are also a BIPOC woman owned and operated business and a portion of their profits also go to a cat charity to help cats find their forever home, which I think is absolutely incredible. And I first found Mooncat over a year ago now from their Hocus Pocus 2 collection. And this is where my love began. And I have purchased so many Mooncat polishes. I recently purchased their Nightmare Before Christmas collection and they're my favorite collection that Mooncat have ever done which was the Alice in Wonderland collection. Oh my god look at this. Look at the packaging. And right now is the perfect time to try Mooncat polishes because they have their Lunar Eclipse sale and the sale is running from the 3rd of November to the 12th of November and Mooncat don't do many sales. They only have two sales a year and this is their end of year sale. They don't have Black Friday sales? No, this is their last sale of the year. Now, if you don't quite know what to pick up, I have some recommendations for you. I have my three favorite Mooncat polishes here, which I recommend to everyone. The first one being the shade Millennia. And this is a magnetic shade. It literally looks like a galaxy on your nails. It is so stunning. I cannot get over this shade. And then we have Mermaid Bait, which is probably the most unique nail polish in my collection. It's just one of those shades that looks different in every angle and in every lighting. And then my favorite Mooncat nail polish, House of Hades. This one is for all of my blue nail polish lovers out there. There are no words to describe how beautiful this shade is and the camera truly doesn't do it justice. And I'm also wearing the shade Catfished, which I matched to my makeup for today's video. And then if you want to know what I'm picking up in the sale, because I am so excited for this sale, I have been waiting. I have my wish list ready and my wish list is so long. Like seriously, it goes on and on and on. And I have three pages. And obviously I'm not going to pick up everything because that would be crazy. But the three shades that I am definitely picking up. Number one, Dark Horse. This is a stunning 
like brown, coppery, rich goodness kind of shade. This is autumn in an owl polish. And then Sin Eater. I am so excited for this shade because it's kind of like a duochrome. It's kind of like a brown, burgundy, red, pink, gold. And then also the shade Space Oddity. This again, this reminds me of House of Hades. It kind of looks like it has a similar formula, but it's a pink fuchsia version of House of Hades. And you can get to Mooncat's website by using the link in my description box. So go check out Mooncat's sale right now. The majority of the website is 20% off. And also don't forget to use the code LUNA20 at checkout. That is very important. Also, let me know the shades that you are picking up in the sale because I'm nosy and I want to know. So thank you again to Mooncat for sponsoring today's video. But I just want to thank every single one of you guys watching right now, because truly without all of you guys, I wouldn't get opportunities like this to work with some of my favorite brands. So I just want to thank you all so, so, so much from the bottom of my heart. And now let's jump into today's case where you can see me create this look that I have matched to my nails. Taylor Parker was born on, I think, the 8th of December, 1992. Now don't quote me on that. I couldn't find many official sources that actually said her date of birth. And I just found one source that said the 8th of December. So I don't know. So she's possibly a Sagittarius. And she grew up in the city of Mount Pleasant in Texas, where she lived with her parents, Mark and Shona and her younger brother, Zachary. And growing up, Taylor had a pretty normal childhood. Her parents loved and adored her. They doted on her. She got really good grades. She played basketball and baseball and she was on the cheerleading squad. However, when Taylor got to the third grade, so she was about eight or nine years old at this point, this is where things start to uh, go a little bit wrong in her life. And this is where the red flags begin because at the young age of eight or nine, Taylor was a pathological liar. And this would be a personality trait that she would have for the rest of her life. She was just one of those kids that would say the craziest stories. And was it for attention? Your guess is as good as mine. But also when Taylor was in the third grade, she started to develop really bad stomach problems. And her stomach issues were that bad that she actually actually missed most of the third grade. Now, whether these stomach issues were actually legitimate or not, I actually couldn't confirm. Knowing Taylor, this is probably a lie. And I did read that Taylor started to have problems with one of her teachers in the third grade. And then all of a sudden these stomach issues popped up. So maybe these stomach issues were a way of Taylor just making excuses to not go to school because she didn't like her teacher. I don't know. Because then all of a sudden when it was the fourth grade, these stomach issues, they just went away. And when Taylor was in the fourth grade, wow, 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 the most absurd lies were coming out of her mouth. And she was coming out with the most bizarre story is that any nine or maybe 10, she's probably around nine or 10 at this point, these stories should not be leaving a nine or 10 year old's mouth. She would tell her friends that she had cancer, which obviously she didn't. She would also tell people that her family were involved with the mafia, which again, they weren't. But then the worst and most bizarre story is that Taylor would go around telling people that she had sex with someone in a shower. What nine-year-old makes up a story that they've had sex in a shower? It's like, what the hell are they being exposed to at home? The whole, oh, my family's in the mafia. I, I can almost wrap my head around that because kids, they do sometimes like want to show off and they exaggerate and stuff. I'm like, oh, my family's scary. They're involved with the mafia. So that one I can kind of wrap my head around. But the cancer one and then the sex one? What the hell? But on top of being a prolific liar, she was also a massive bully. No one liked her in school. No one, because she was a bully. She went from being like a pretty nice girl, she had a lot of friends, to then all of a sudden she's just horrible. And it just makes me think, what happened? I don't know, but I just feel like something happened. Taylor would make up stories about other children in her class and she would spread around these rumors. She would also make up lies and tell her teacher to get other kids in trouble. So understandably, no one liked her. She would never be invited to birthday parties or slumber parties. However, just because she wasn't invited, that never stopped her. Taylor would just turn up at slumber parties, even though she wasn't invited. And this is when Taylor is nine, maybe 10 years old. She doesn't grow out of this behavior. She is a pathological liar. She's a bully and she's a manipulator. And it's just so crazy that she was like that from a very young age. So Taylor, she goes 
goes to high school, she's now a teenager and things just only get worse. First of all, her parents got divorced and this had a huge impact on the family. And Taylor and her brother, they were actually split up. Taylor went to stay with her dad and her brother, Zachary, stayed with their mom. And this was actually Taylor's decision because Taylor didn't like her mom. So she decided to stay with her dad. Taylor's dad, Mark, he didn't care about his children at all. He would actually just use them as bargaining chips and to impress other women. And the whole divorce and everything, and everything that now Taylor was being exposed to, she started to develop anxiety. And she really struggled with her mental health. And it is said that she turned to food for comfort. And she did put on quite a bit of weight and weighed around 250 pounds by the time she was 14 years old. And when she was in high school, the lies, they just continued. Taylor would still claim to have very serious health problems. She would still tell people that she had cancer. She would also tell people that she had multiple sclerosis. There would be times as well when Taylor would turn up to school with crutches and she would just be using the crutches to try and get attention off others. She would always be feigning illnesses to try and go to hospital to get tested for things. Taylor was so desperate to be ill. She always wanted to play the victim. She wanted people to feel sorry for her. She would be sharing pictures with her friends on social media of herself in hospital with tubes coming out of her nose, out of her arm, telling the world how sick she was just to get sympathy from people. And if you ask me, this kind of sounds a little bit like Munchausen. And as well as the illnesses, Taylor would also lie about having sex. Again, the sex thing. She would tell people that she was regularly having sex with her boyfriend and she would brag to people, tell them about her experiences. And again, this was not true. Taylor didn't even have a boyfriend. So when she would tell people in school about her boyfriend, people would say, oh, can I see a picture of him? Because this boyfriend, this mysterious boyfriend, of course he went to a different school. So when people would ask, oh, can I see a picture of your boyfriend? She would just say, oh no, I don't have any photos of him. He's camera shot. And it was just so obvious that she didn't have any photos of him because she didn't have a boyfriend. But she would say, oh, look at these messages though that he's just sent me. And they would be very like flirtatious messages between Taylor and her mysterious boyfriend. But again, it was so obvious that Taylor had just faked these messages to herself. On top of all of this, Taylor would also try and catfish other boys online or maybe even other men. I don't know. But she would randomly go up to girls in her school and ask them for indecent images so she could put them online and catfish other boys. Thankfully, all of the girls that she approached said no. And then there was something else that Taylor liked to do in school, and that was lie about being pregnant. Oh yes, she would say that her mysterious boyfriend, oh my god, he's knocked her up. She would be pregnant so many times in high school and then she would all of a sudden have a miscarriage and it was all a lie. And this whole thing about lying about pregnancies and then having miscarriages is very significant to today's case. And another girl in her class actually did fall pregnant in high school and Taylor became obsessed with her. So Taylor took a photo of this pregnant girl and went home and edited the photo and Taylor put her own head on this pregnant girl's body. So it looked like this was a photo of Taylor pregnant. And then Taylor, with this edited photo of herself with the pregnant belly, she would start showing everyone at school, oh look, I'm pregnant. And so many people did confront her about all of these lies, but Taylor would just lie even more to get herself out of the lies that she told in the first place. And if they didn't believe her lies, then she would just cut them off altogether. And I'm not diagnosing her, I'm not, but this just seems like typical narcissistic behavior. When confronted with her obvious lies, it is just physically impossible for Taylor to actually admit to those lies. And she just lies even more and she gets very defensive, very angry. So a few more years pass and Taylor is now 17 years old and she actually does full pregnant. Like this is legitimate. She actually is pregnant. She slept with a teenage boy called Donald and they were not boyfriend or girlfriend from my understanding. I think it was just kind of like a one night hookup kind of thing. And Donald didn't want anything to do with the baby. Like he just disappeared from the picture. He did a runner. He dropped out of Taylor's life and he never paid any child support. 
nothing. So Taylor, when she is pregnant, she actually does drop out of school and she gives birth to a baby girl. So Taylor is currently a very young single mom. But when Taylor is 18 years old, she enters into her first very serious relationship with a man called Tommy Wakasey. And pretty much straight away, the two of them got married. They did not waste any time. And Taylor, you would think, okay, she's 18 now. She's an adult. She's also a mom. Has she grown out of the lying and the manipulative behavior and the attention seeking? And the answer to that would be no. It actually just gets more and more extreme. And as soon as she married Tommy, oh my God, her lies got so out of hand. So in the beginning of their relationship, it was all great. Because that is very common, isn't it? In the beginning of these relationships with a narcissist, it's all so great. They reel you in, they get their claws into you, and then they show you their true colors. And that's exactly what happened in this relationship. So first of all, Taylor cut off all of her family. She cut off her dad, her mom, and her younger brother. And she started telling Tommy this web of lies about her family. She told Tommy that her family were wealthy. And I'm not just talking wealthy, I'm talking about old money kind of wealthy. She told Tommy that her dad apparently owned the Morton Salt Company and Taylor was the heiress of this company and she was going to come into a lot of money. I'm talking millions, millions and millions of dollars she was set to inherit. But as well as her family being extremely rich, they were also very evil. It kind of goes back to her lies in school, doesn't it, of her family has connections to the mafia. But Taylor would say that her family was so powerful, so evil, especially her mom. Her mom had connections to bad people in high places. And her mom, Shona, was always threatening Taylor. Shona wanted her daughter dead. These are actually the lies that she would tell Tommy. And Tommy apparently believed these lies. And as the marriage went on, none of the money that Taylor was set to inherit ever materialized. So they struggled for money because it was only Tommy me working because Taylor said that she didn't need to work because she was set to inherit all of this money. But in reality, Taylor was just incredibly lazy. She didn't want a job. She was one of these people that was allergic to to work. So she would go out and get a job and then she would quit the very same day and she would just sit on the sofa all day. And Tommy was getting a little bit fed up because he was the only one earning money for the family. Because remember that Taylor has a daughter. So Tommy is financially supporting his wife and his stepdaughter and Taylor is not doing anything. So Tommy was getting a bit fed up. And this is when Taylor started to fake illnesses again. She started to fake illnesses so she didn't have to go out to work. Taylor would say that she was so sick, that she was so ill, that she couldn't even get out of bed. All of these mysterious illnesses would just always pop up and Tommy apparently believed them. So Tommy went out to work. He was the only one working. So he was earning all of the money for the family. And then he would come home and he would do all of the housework, all of the chores, cooking, cleaning. He would also be the only one looking after Taylor's daughter because Taylor was just so ill. She couldn't move, but it was a lie. Taylor was perfectly fine. Taylor was just lying on the sofa all day watching TV and posting on social media about how sick she was. She would also go around to various different family members and beg them for money because she was just too sick to work. She also applied for benefits and food stamps. She lied about her marital status and her husband's income to get money from the government that she wasn't entitled to. And this went on for months and then it turned into years. For years, Taylor was faking all of these illnesses and Taylor would just keep going round to so many doctors trying to get diagnosed with anything. She would go from one doctor to the next and tell them about all of these fake symptoms that she was having to try and get diagnosed with things like cancer and MS. She even told one doctor that she'd had a stroke. Taylor even went to one doctor and said that she had lost the ability to see color. Again, this was a lie. The only thing that Taylor ever got diagnosed with was migraines. And Taylor soon became addicted to prescription medication after taking so many strong painkillers for illness 
illnesses that she didn't even have. So she would soon go on a process called doctor shopping. And I had never heard of the term doctor shopping before, but it basically meant that Taylor was going from one doctor to the next to the next, trying to get as many prescriptions as she possibly could from all of these different doctors so she could stockpile all of her drugs for her addiction. And whenever a doctor would tell her that there's nothing wrong with her, so i.e. the doctor would be telling her the truth, Taylor would just go out and find another doctor. And because Taylor was going to so many doctors, she racked up a medical bill of $40,000, which was left up to Tommy to pay. And it's just crazy. Like, why does she so desperately want to have an illness? So a few more years pass, and now Taylor is 21 years old, and quite a few things happen when she is 21 quite quickly. So first of all, Taylor falls pregnant with Tommy, and she goes on to have a son. And I'm just like, why the hell is she getting pregnant again? She doesn't even care about her first child, her daughter. Ever since her daughter was born, Taylor has just neglected her. She has pawned her daughter off to as many different people as she possibly can because she doesn't want to look after her. She doesn't care. However, Taylor falls pregnant. She has a son. And because she was pregnant, because she has a newborn, she was getting a lot of attention from people. So she was showing her son a little bit more attention than her daughter. And it's only because her son is all shiny and new because it wasn't too long until Taylor got bored of her son. And she was like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Don't want any more children. It's not for me. So she makes the decision to undergo tubal ligation. And it is more commonly referenced as having your tubes tied. It is basically a method of birth control to prevent an egg going into the uterus. However, it is not reversible. At least that is my understanding. So it basically means that Taylor can't have any more children. And this is important for the rest of today's case. And following this, Taylor also decided decided that she wanted to undergo another procedure. So she flew out to Mexico to have gastric band surgery, which I can only assume was funded by Tommy. And following the surgery, she lost a significant amount of weight. However, after the surgery, and I'm not sure if it was because of the surgery, like I just don't know, but Taylor did start to experience real medical problems. She had real symptoms now. This is like the first time that she's actually having real symptoms. Taylor was having unexplained heavy bleeding from her uterus and she was diagnosed with endometriosis. So then Taylor had to go through another procedure and she was put under anesthesia. And whilst Taylor was going through this procedure, the doctor saw that her endometriosis was a lot worse than they had originally thought. And without Taylor's involvement, the decision was made for her to undergo an emergency hysterectomy. So then Taylor, when she woke up after the surgery, she was told that her uterus had been removed. Taylor had already made the decision herself to have her tubes tied, which meant that she couldn't get pregnant anyway. But now that she's also had her uterus removed, it is now 100% impossible for Taylor to ever get pregnant again. And then following the gastric band surgery and the hysterectomy, it is said that Taylor became a completely different person. She completely lost all interest in her family. But let's be realistic, she never really had that much interest in her family anyway, but now there is zero interest. She was now completely neglecting and ignoring her five-year-old daughter and her new baby, like her new baby son. And instead, Taylor was now more interested in going out, partying and drinking. She also started posting a ton of photos on Facebook, quote, flaunting her new body. She would post very revealing photos of herself and she would flirt with so many men on social media behind Tommy's back. She would also edit her photos to make herself look like a completely different person. And she also started to send indecent images of herself to other men in private messages. And Tommy did find out about this, but Taylor being very manipulative, she just kind of brushed it off and tried to play it off that it was okay. Also Taylor, with Tommy's money, started up many businesses. She wanted to come across on social media that she was like this boss ass bitch, that she was in charge, that she had all of these successful businesses, but she would start a business, she would throw herself into it, but then she would get bored and just waste all of Tommy's money. And then we get to 2016. Taylor is currently 23 years old. And this is when things start to change even more 
more. Because this is when Taylor befriends a woman called Caitlin Glass. And it turns out that Caitlin had MS. And when Taylor met Caitlin and Caitlin said that she had MS, Taylor was like, oh my God, no way. I have MS too. What a coincidence. And obviously Taylor doesn't have MS, but Caitlin has no reason to doubt her because who the hell lies about that? But now that Taylor has her new friend, Caitlin, Taylor becomes obsessed with Caitlin. She starts following her around like a little lost puppy dog. She starts starts to attend all of Caitlin's hospital appointments. And whenever Caitlin would have MS symptoms, Taylor would also suddenly start to have the same MS symptoms. Taylor was basically following Caitlin around so she could learn as much as she possibly could about MS. So she could fake having MS herself. And Taylor would admit herself into hospital experiencing the same MS symptoms that Caitlin had. But Caitlin, in the beginning, she believed this. She believed that Taylor was having all of the same symptoms that she was. However, she started to become suspicious of Taylor because Caitlin, her MS symptoms, they would last for weeks. After she got out of hospital, she would be struggling and she would have to recover. But Taylor, she would make miraculously quick recoveries and it just wasn't adding up to Caitlin. So Caitlin started to become suspicious of Taylor. But whilst Taylor is pretty much stalking Caitlin's life, she really did want to mimic every aspect of Caitlin's life. So Caitlin was a part of this group called the Jeep Club, as in Jeep the car. And I didn't even know that these clubs existed. But basically this Jeep club, people that owned a Jeep would meet up and kind of like drive around and then they would go for drinks or food and just hang out, you know, like a little club. But basically Taylor made Tommy buy her a Jeep so she could join this club. And bear in mind, they couldn't afford it, but Taylor managed to manipulate Tommy into buying her a Jeep. So Taylor would just disappear for whole weekends at a time at this Jeep club. And this Jeep club that Taylor was a part of, they would go for weekends away and she just would leave her two children at home not caring. But then when she was on these weekends away with the Jeep Club, she would cheat on Tommy. There was one time where she was caught sleeping with one of the men and the man's wife walked in on them and Taylor would tell everyone at the Jeep Club that her husband Tommy was very abusive and that is why she would cheat on him. That is why she would always go away because she needed to get away from him and Taylor would throw herself into walls and into furniture to give herself bruises. And there was even one time where Taylor tried to cheat with Caitlin's husband. Yes, Caitlin, her new best friend, she tried to sleep with Caitlin's husband. So this was pretty much the final straw for Caitlin. She didn't really want anything to do with Taylor after this. And Tommy was just at home looking after the kids and he would have no idea where Taylor was. And to explain her absences, Taylor said to Tommy that she was actually becoming a nurse, that she was attending nursing school. So that is where she was when she was away for the weekend. She she was being a nurse and she was called in for an emergency operation. And you may be thinking, how did Tommy fall for all of this? How did he never find out that all of this was lies? Well, that is because Taylor would go onto his Facebook and his social media and block anyone that could expose her double life. But in the end, Tommy did find out about all of the lies, about the fact that she was cheating on him, that she wasn't a nurse, that her family were not evil people, that they were not rich. And Tommy left Taylor immediately and filed for divorce. So that was Taylor's first roller coaster of a relationship. And now we move on to her second one because she does not waste any time whatsoever. So Taylor is currently 25 years old and she jumps into her second relationship. She first moves out of the home that she has shared with Tommy and she leaves her son behind, but she takes her daughter with her and Taylor just starts to sleep around with loads of different men and she takes her daughter with her. So she would just go to these random men's homes. She would go and have sex with these men upstairs and she would leave her daughter downstairs. And after the separation, Taylor pretty much showed no interest in her son, but she still had visitation rights. So on the rare occasions that she would have her son, she would just completely neglect him. And he would be in a terrible state. Whenever he was returned back to his dad, back to Tommy, he would be unwashed. He wouldn't have been fed properly. There was one 
one time where he had a big sore on his bottom and Tommy took him to the hospital and it turns out that their son had a bacterial infection because Taylor didn't change his underwear for five days. So that was the final straw for Tommy and he stopped visitation rights altogether. Taylor also left her daughter at random family members' homes most of the time so she would barely even look after her daughter. Taylor has two children that she's just not interested in whatsoever and it really is just ironic given what Taylor goes on to do. So Taylor now enters into a brand new relationship with a man called Hunter Parker and as soon as Taylor met Hunter she was infatuated with him which does seem to be the case with Taylor whenever she meets somebody she becomes obsessed with them and it wasn't long until Taylor rushed through her divorce proceedings because yeah she's still going through a divorce and she rushes through her divorce so she can marry Hunter just 11 days after her divorce has been finalized. And just like Tommy, the relationship with Hunter started off great. However, it wasn't long until Taylor started to lie and lie and lie. She started with the same kind of lies, that her family were powerful, that they were wealthy, that they had old money, but they were also evil. They hated her and they were out to get her. She would also lie about illnesses. She told Hunter that she had MS. She would fake seizures and various other illnesses. But the biggest lie that Taylor told was that she was still able to have children. Now Taylor told this lie because Hunter had expressed that he really wanted children, that he wanted to start a family, and Taylor lied. In order not to lose Hunter, she told Hunter that she also did want children and that she could have children. But it soon came out that this was a lie because Hunter was at the hospital with Taylor for one of her many mysterious illnesses. And whilst they were in the appointment, the doctor revealed that Taylor couldn't have children. And Hunter was sat right there. So Hunter, when he found out this, he was furious. He was so angry that Taylor had lied to him and he wanted to leave Taylor. But Taylor manipulated him into staying by faking more illnesses. And Taylor has no interest in having any more children. I mean, she already has two children that she is neglecting. However, Taylor couldn't shake the feeling that Hunter was going to leave her. If she didn't give him a baby, he would leave her for someone else. So this is when Taylor came up with a plan on how she was going to give Hunter a baby. And that was through surrogacy. And when she approached Hunter with this idea, Hunter was like, we don't have any money. Like, how are we supposed to afford this? But this is when Taylor came out with her good old lies that she was set to inherit a lot of money very soon. She said that she was due to inherit a large sum of money from her grandma and that a mysterious man called Tim Hightower would soon be in touch on the details of her inheritance. And if you haven't figured out, this Tim Hightower is a fake person. It is just Taylor. So it wasn't long until this Tim Hightower started texting Hunter that he would deliver $100,000 very soon. I don't know how, but Hunter bought all of these lies. And I'm just sat here thinking, how the bloody how did anyone buy these lies? I mean, if this Tim Hightower is actually a real person, why the hell is he texting Hunter? Why wouldn't he be texting and communicating with Taylor, who is supposed to be the person receiving the inheritance? So right now, Hunter believes that very soon Taylor will have the money to pay for a surrogate. But now Taylor starts to display very bizarre bizarre behavior because now she actually needs a surrogate and she basically just goes around and starts begging every single person in her life to be a surrogate for her. For example, there was a former co-worker of Taylor's called Lindsay and she had recently gone through a very, very traumatic miscarriage. So Taylor reached out to her and said, oh, seeing as you're not pregnant anymore, will you be a surrogate for me? She really has no shame. And obviously Lindsay said, no. She even offers Lindsay 20 grand to be a surrogate, but Lindsay still said no. And then on top of this, her two friends, Abby and Mackenzie, they were also trying to get pregnant themselves. And when Taylor found out that both of them were trying to get pregnant, Taylor kept begging them to carry her child instead and even offered them $100,000 each to do so. And both of them said no. They were trying to get pregnant themselves. And then eventually her two friends, Abby and Mackenzie, they did fall pregnant. And oh my God, when they found 
fell pregnant, Taylor became obsessed with them. She wanted to know everything about their pregnancy. She would go to appointments with them. She would follow them around, always check up on them. In fact, she became so obsessed that she even got a job at an OBGYN's office and Taylor would observe the work in the surgical department so she could learn how to perform C-sections. And I am talking like this because this is very, very significant. But thankfully, Abby and Mackenzie, when they gave birth to their children, no harm came to them. And later on, both Abby and Mackenzie have said that in hindsight, they had a very lucky escape from Taylor. And this went on for months. Taylor trying to find someone to carry her baby, keeping up this whole fake story to Hunter that this Tim Hightower was going to deliver a lot of money. And as time passes, Hunter is becoming very suspicious. He's not buying the story that she comes from a lot of money, that she's going to get inheritance. So Hunter says that he needs proof of the money. He needs to see something to prove that it even exists. And this is when Hunter magically receives a text from Tim Hightower of a photo of a blue duffel bag filled with a load of cash. And apparently this photo was supposed to be evidence of the money, but Hunter was still very suspicious. He still thought to himself, this just feels weird. Like, I don't believe this. So Hunter decided to Google blue duffel bag full of money. And guess what? The very first image on Google Images was the exact same image that was sent to Hunter from Tim Hightower. Taylor goes to extreme lengths to build up these fake backstories and these fake people and all of her lies that she really just used the first image on Google Images to text Hunter. Oh my God. And this is when Hunter decided that enough was enough. He could now see through Taylor's games and he discovered that it was actually Taylor who was this person, Tim Hightower. And there was no money. There was no inheritance. There was no evil family. It was all just Taylor and it was all just lies. So he filed for divorce and now Taylor is single again. But again, she is not single for long. So we now get to the summer of 2019. At this point, Taylor is 26 years old and already a lot has happened in this case, but the worst is still to come because we have one last boyfriend to talk about, a man called Wade Griffin. And whilst she is in a relationship with Wade, she would make up the most audacious lies yet. So Taylor met Wade Griffin in the summer of 2019. And again, as soon as she met Wade, she became infatuated and obsessed. They first met at a chance encounter at a rodeo in Texas and they started talking and they fell for one another. And their relationship, it moved very quickly. But all of Taylor's relationships do. So it wasn't long until they were in a very serious relationship. But she doesn't marry Wade, which I found kind of weird because she's married everybody else that she goes into a relationship with. Maybe her divorce was taking a little bit longer. I don't know. And just like the other two relationships in the beginning, Taylor was the most amazing person you could ever meet on this planet. She put on her charm. She would cook Wade dinner. She would help out on Wade's family farm because Wade, he was a welder at a roof company, but he also helped out on his family farm as like a part-time job. And his family farm were apparently a wild hog buying facility. So Taylor would help out on the family farm, you know, getting the good books of the family. She would do all the chores, all the housework. She literally did everything. But within weeks of their relationship, Taylor started coming out with all of her lies that she had a very wealthy family, that they were very powerful, that they had connections to the mafia. Everyone in her family hated her, that she had illnesses. You know, all of the usual lies that Taylor says. However, those were not the only lies that she told to Wade. Because within weeks of their relationship, Taylor fell pregnant with twins. And we all know that she can't get pregnant. But Wade doesn't know this. And I don't know why she faked a pregnancy with Wade. In my opinion, I think she just wants to get her claws in Wade because she's so obsessed with him and she wants to keep him forever. And she thinks getting pregnant is the way to do that. And Wade is over the moon. He is so excited that Taylor is pregnant. Wade has always wanted to be a dad and he doesn't have any children. But did the whole pregnancy ruse last for very long? No, because obviously Taylor is not bloody pregnant. So she obviously needs to think of a way to 
get out of this. So just a few weeks after Taylor announced to the world that she was pregnant with twins, Wade got a mysterious phone call from someone claiming to be Taylor's dad. And the person on the phone was very frantic, very emotional. And the person on the phone said to Wade that Taylor had been in a very serious accident, that she had been helping someone tow a car. And when she was towing the car, the tow cable snapped and hit Taylor directly in the stomach, causing Taylor to miscarry. And obviously this would be an absolutely horrific accident if it was true, but it's not. And the man that Wade was talking to, pretending to be Taylor's father, was actually Taylor. She was using a voice distortion app. And again, it's just crazy the lengths that this woman will go to. So a few more weeks pass after the fake miscarriage. And Wade is distant. To be honest, I think he was clocking on to the fact that Taylor just lied about everything. And Taylor got the feeling that Wade was going to leave her and she just simply could not let that happen. So this is when Taylor started to say to Wade that she was going to inherit a lot of money. Again, she was saying all of the usual lies that Taylor does, that she came from a very rich family, that she came from old money, that her family owned oil businesses. So we're talking oil kind of money. So we're talking millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, if not billions. And Taylor started to say all of this to Wade, hoping that he will stay for the money. And Wade, he had no reason to doubt her, even though I feel like he has a million reasons to doubt her, but Wade, he believed her. Again, I think this just shows how good she is at manipulating people. So Taylor and Wade started spending a lot of money. Taylor convinced Wade to start spending all of this money on finance because Taylor was going to inherit millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, just take all of these things out on finance. Don't worry about it. I'll pay for it later. And the amount of money that these two spent, oh my God, why the hell would you spend this much money if you don't have it? They ended up spending $29,000. Wow. $29,000 on farming equipment for Wade's family, $21,000 on cattle for the family farm. Again, what the hell? $92,000 on a new pickup truck for Wade. $92,000 on a pickup truck. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not dissing anyone's pickup truck, but $92,000. That pickup truck must have gold in it. They even bought Wade's mom a brand new gray Nissan Ultima. Ultima, is that how you pronounce it? And this was Wade's mom's dream car. And then they also spent $50,000 renovating one of Taylor's properties. So Wade has taken out all of this finance in his name because yeah, Taylor convinced him to take out all of this money in his name. So the debt was piling up and interest on that much money would be a lot. But Taylor just kept saying, don't worry, don't worry, the money will come. The inheritance is going to be here soon. But the money, it didn't materialize and the bills were stacking up. The family farming equipment was repossessed. On top of all of this, Taylor phoned up Wade's mom and said to her that she needed to take the new Nissan back to the dealer because it had been recalled. And Wade's mom, Connie, didn't believe this. So she phoned up the dealer herself and the dealer was like, what do you mean a recall? We haven't recalled any cars. The only thing wrong with your car is that it was bought by a woman called Taylor and we haven't received any payments for it. So basically the car was being repossessed as well. And this is when Wade's parents figured out that Taylor was lying about all of the money and that she was getting their son into a lot of debt. So Wade's parents told Wade that he needed to get out of this relationship quickly. He needed to get as far away from Taylor as possible. But was Taylor just going to accept Wade breaking up with her? No. She wanted to make sure that Wade stayed with her at all costs. And this is when she came out with her next audacious lie. She told Wade that the reason that the inheritance money hadn't showed up was because Taylor's evil mom was trying to kill her. You really can't make this stuff up, can you? This is more confusing and complicated than a bloody movie. Taylor told Wade that as soon as her mom Shona had found out that Taylor was going to inherit millions and millions of dollars, Shona wanted to put a stop to it by executing her own daughter. And somehow Shona had intercepted the transfer of of the millions and millions of dollars and she was using Taylor's inheritance money to hire the Mexican mafia and put out a hit on her own daughter. And this just sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? This just sounds so far-fetched and you would think that Wade, who has started to become suspicious
suspicious of Tyler, would now see through her lies. But he doesn't. He believes this story. He believes that her mom is trying to kill her. And soon, Tyler starts receiving threatening emails from a random person called Mandy Boyd, which was apparently Tyler's mom, Shona, in disguise. And in these threatening emails, would say that she doesn't deserve to live, that she is a terrible person. And then this Mandy person started sending Tyler emails about Tyler and Wade's every move. So basically telling them, oh, I saw you doing this today, or I'm watching you. And Taylor showed Wade these emails and she was like, look, look, my mom is so powerful. She's so rich. She must have hacked our phones. She knows all of our movements. She knows exactly what we're doing, when we are doing it and where. And Wade fell for it. But that wasn't the only ridiculous lie that Taylor told Wade. Taylor started to send messages to herself pretending to be a man called Coburn, who was apparently Currently, a high ranking agent for the FBI. And this agent Coburn had been assigned to Taylor to protect her from the hit on her life from the Mexican mafia. Yes, Taylor now has her very own personal FBI agent protecting her from the Mexican mafia. And this FBI agent would send messages to Wade telling him that his girlfriend was in terrible danger and that they both needed to do everything that they could to protect Taylor. And this FBI agent also told Wade that in order to protect Taylor, Taylor and her daughter must move in with him. So at this point, Taylor and Wade, they were still living separately because they had only been together for a few months. It is crazy. So much has happened and they have only been together for a few months. So they are currently living separately, but Taylor wanted to live with Wade. So she uses this whole fake FBI agent to convince Wade to get Taylor to live with him. It is so confusing, isn't it? But oh my God, Wade invites Taylor and her daughter to live with him so he can protect them from the Mexican mafia. And once Taylor is living there, Wade receives text messages from Agent Coburn that there were FBI agents stationed around the home protecting them all. But they were in disguise, so you wouldn't see them. And Wade, if he ever saw anyone hanging around outside the home, don't approach them because that will blow the cover of the FBI agents. It's just so far-fetched. I can't believe this. It's so far-fetched, but Wade, he believed all of this. So in late 2019, only a few months after they started dating, the FBI sent a message to Taylor saying after a long shootout, they had finally arrested her mom Shona. But that wasn't the only shocking thing, no. Because now that Shona was arrested, she was in jail. But whilst she was in jail, she had hung herself and she was now dead. So this whole debacle with the Mexican mafia and the inheritance money and everything, that was soon going to be behind them. Or at least that is what Wade thought. And then after all of the craziness with Taylor's mom, Taylor makes one more big gesture to try and make up for everything. Taylor tells Wade that she is going to buy him him a $3.5 million home. You heard that right. Because now that her mom was dead, she would get her inheritance. And I know what you're thinking. There is no way that she's going to be able to purchase a home. Like she's, there's no way, but she definitely tries. So she goes through the house buying process and she finds a home. It's $3.5 million. It's like this big mansion. It's huge. And Taylor signs all of like the documents and contracts. And she is supposed to put down a $200,000 deposit, which is pocket money for a multi millionaire. The realtors and whoever's dealing with this, they believe that Taylor is a multi-millionaire. So they're waiting for the deposit to appear, but it doesn't. Taylor keeps trying to make wire transfers of the $200,000 deposit, but every single time they fail. She even tries to pay the deposit in oil and gas royalty certificates, because remember her family, they come from oil. That's the kind of money that they have. And Taylor sets up a fake email pretending to be someone from the Western Shell Energy Company. And this person sends over all of this fake documentation about these royalties royalties from the oil company that is the equivalent of $200,000. However, what the realtor fails to notice is that all of these emails from this representative of this oil company, they have been sent from an AOL email address, which is like, oh my God, could there be more of a glaring red flag? It hadn't come from an official company email address. It had come from just a regular AOL email address. And that is like 
Rule number one, if you think you are being scammed, look at the email address. And this went back and forth for months. The realtor trying to get the deposit for the home and Taylor just keeps saying, oh, my family fortune is going to check in soon. But eventually they discovered that the royalty certificates were fake and the house buying process, it fell through and Taylor was not able to buy her $3.5 million home. But remember, she was buying this home for Wade. So what was her excuse? Excuse going to be? Why did this house sale fall through? Well, of course, Taylor blamed it on her evil mom, Shona. But remember, Shona was supposed to be dead. Well, you're never going to believe this. Taylor tells Wade that her little FBI agent lied to her. Shona wasn't dead. In fact, she had escaped from prison and now she was sabotaging the money and she was going to come after Taylor. But what is the craziest thing is that it is now Christmas 2019 and Taylor and Wade go to a family party that is being hosted by Taylor's aunt. And who else is also at this party? Taylor's evil mom, Shona. And Wade believes that Shona is this evil woman, that she is sabotaging her daughter, that she has put a hit out on her daughter, that she's in contact with the Mexican mafia. So Wade and Shona are now in the same room. And this is where it should all come out. All of these lies, they should come out right now, but it doesn't. Wade at this party is literally just sat there and he is terrified. He is terrified of Shona because of how evil and powerful she is. And I just want to remind you all that Shona is a completely normal person. She's not evil at all. And Wade is sat there so terrified. He doesn't really say a single word at this party because he's so scared. So now we get to the start of 2020. Wade and Taylor have been together for a approximately six months, only six months, and so much has happened. Now, to no surprise, Wade's family absolutely hated Taylor. They could see Taylor for what she was. They kept telling Wade, please leave her. She's no good for you. She's gotten you into all of this debt. Remember that? Wade is drowning in debt because of Taylor. And Wade was starting to see through all of Taylor's lies. He was starting to listen to his family and his friends. He started to listen to all of the warnings. He started to see all of the red flags for himself. And Taylor realized this. She realized that she was about to lose Wade and she couldn't lose him. She was obsessed with him. She wanted to keep him forever. And this is when the pretty much the last massive twist to this story begins. Because Taylor thought to herself that there was one way, one sure way to make sure that Wade would never leave her. And this is when Taylor fell pregnant again with Wade's child. Now you gotta remember, cause it's very easy to forget because this case is so bloody confusing, but Taylor did fall pregnant with twins at the beginning of their relationship. And Wade was absolutely devastated after Taylor miscarried. But remember, all of that is a lie. So now Taylor is pregnant again, but of course she is not. And Taylor was really hoping that Wade would be over the moon, but he wasn't. Wade wasn't happy at all. He was terrified because he was in so much debt. They had no money. And he thought to himself, how the hell am I going to be able to afford a child? But Wade was a good person and he stepped up and he wanted to be a good father and he was excited about being a father. So on the 14th of March, 2020, this is when Taylor announced on social media that she was pregnant. Now, the 14th of March, 2020, that is pretty much when the whole world was in lockdown. I can't say the word because YouTube doesn't like it, but you know what I'm talking about. I can't say the C word or the P word. So I'm just going to say lockdown, but we all know what I'm talking about. So pretty much the whole world was in lockdown. And this is very important. The fact that the whole world was in lockdown because of all of the restrictions and everything, this is very important. So Taylor put it on social media. I'm pregnant. I'm going to have my third child. Because again, I think it's very easy to forget that she already has two children that she doesn't care about. But this revelation that Taylor was pregnant would soon end in the most horrific tragedy that you've ever heard. But we'll get back to that. So after Taylor announces on social media that she is pregnant, a lot of people are skeptical. First of all, Wade's family, they don't believe it. They have gotten to a point where they don't believe anything that Taylor says. They think that Taylor is just doing this to trap Wade. So even if she is pregnant, she's doing it for the wrong reasons. But it wasn't just Wade's family that was suspicious. Old friends of Taylor's were seeing this post on social media and they knew that Taylor couldn't have any more children. One of Taylor's friends, a woman called Anne, 
Angela, she was also a mutual friend of Wade's, she was very concerned because she knew that Taylor had had a hysterectomy. So she did some digging herself and she went to a pharmacy, bought a load of pregnancy tests from all different brands, went over to Taylor and demanded that Taylor take these pregnancy tests to prove that she was pregnant. So Taylor, she took all of these pregnancy tests, but they all came back negative. But Taylor, we know that she lies to get out of her lies. Taylor was like, oh no, there must be something wrong. There must be something faulty with the tests. I'm definitely pregnant. So obviously her friend didn't believe that she was pregnant anymore. And Taylor was worried that her lies were going to be exposed. So to try and prove it to Angela that she was pregnant, a few days later, Taylor handed Angela a pregnancy verification letter. And Taylor was really hoping that Angela wouldn't look too closely at this letter because it was in someone else's name. Don't even ask me how she got this letter, but Angela did look at the letter and she saw that it was in someone else's name. So Taylor just blamed it on a misprint and said that it was her nurse's name and she doesn't really know why that it was in her nurse's name and not her name. So Angela is really like suspicious now. She truly does not believe that Taylor is pregnant. So she drives Taylor to a clinic but this is April of 2020, lockdown. Angela wasn't allowed in the clinic. Only Taylor was allowed in there on her own. So Taylor went into this clinic and she came out with a real pregnancy verification letter. Again, do not ask me how she got this. It was a forgery. She handed it to Angela and Angela was finally satisfied that Taylor was pregnant. So now that a lot of people were satisfied that Taylor was pregnant, in the first few months of her pregnancy, she got away with the story that she was pregnant. However, a few months pass and Taylor should have started to show that she was pregnant. However, she wasn't. And because Taylor didn't look pregnant, the rumors started again. Now, of course, every pregnancy looks different. Some people show very early on. Some people don't show until very late on. Every pregnancy is different. However, everyone in Taylor's life was used to her lies and her behavior and her attention-seeking behavior. So we can all understand why people were suspicious and skeptical. However, Taylor needed to silence all of these rumors. So she started to look for fake baby bumps. And this is when she came across a website called fakeababy.com. I'm not kidding. There is an actual website called fakeababy.com. Go look at it for yourself. You will be gobsmacked. Your jaw will be on the ground. I went to this website because I wanted to see for myself, like, is it actually a legitimate thing? Like, is it a real website? And it is, and I could not believe it. It's a real website. And on this website, you can buy fake sonogram pictures, sonogram videos, fake ultrasounds, fake pregnancy documents, which is maybe where she got that forgery pregnancy verification letter from, fake DNA results, and even fake pregnancy bellies. And oh my God, I am sorry. Does no one else see the problem with a website like this? Now the website brands itself as a prank website, but no, 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 no. Can you see this? No, no. And it ships to the UK. It's in UK pounds. I think they ship international. Like, look at that. For 13 pounds, custom fake ultrasound sonogram. Prank your friends now. Oh God, no. This just makes me feel like so uncomfortable. Oh my God, at the top, you know, like at this top bit, it says, how can I get his attention? We can help. No, 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 no. That is not okay. That is not okay. No. And when Taylor found that website, because that is the exact website that she used, she must have been rubbing her hands together thinking, oh my God, this is a gold mine. So she bought a fake baby bump and Wade never saw her naked during this time. And it was a really good baby bump as well. Like it felt real. And Wade never felt the baby kick because obviously there was no bloody baby in there. But apparently other people did feel the baby kick and they reassured Wade. They were like, don't worry, Wade. We felt the baby kick the other day. She also bought the fake documents and the sonograms, ultrasounds, everything from this website. And she would show Wade all of this. And of course, because it was locked down, Wade could never go to the appointments with her. He just had to trust her word. And I truly think that if it wasn't for lockdown, I don't think Taylor would have been able to pull this off. The couple even had a gender reveal party where they found out that they were having a girl and they decided to name their baby girl Clancy Gale. And not long after the gender reveal, Taylor and Wade had a little pregnancy photo shoot, which I will put some images up of the photo shoot for you. 
and it looks real. If I saw those photos, I wouldn't question them. And Taylor shared these photos all over social media. There were some people that were still suspicious, but most people at this point, I think, believed her. And Wade especially believed her. So now we get to August of 2020. Taylor is currently seven months pregnant. So we are only a couple of months away from Taylor needing to give birth. And Taylor was getting desperate. She was panicking. She was thinking, how am I going to get away with this? Like, how am I going to actually pull this off? But before Taylor could figure out the answer to this question, she would see a post on Facebook that would change everything. And this post came from a completely innocent, sweet woman called Reagan Hancock. And Reagan was now about to be pulled into this nightmare world of Taylor. So Reagan Hancock was born on the 12th of November, 1998. She was currently 21 years old and she has been described as just an incredible person. The sweetest, kindest person you would ever meet. She didn't have a bad bone in her body. She went to church every weekend and she loved spending time with her friends and family. And Reagan was currently living in New Boston, Texas. She worked in customer service. She had a three-year-old daughter named Kinley from a previous relationship. And she was now married to her current partner, a man called Homer. And Reagan and Homer, they were just totally in love. They were a young couple that loved and adored one another. They were in the prime of their lives and they had only gotten married a year prior. And guess who was the photographer at their wedding? None other than Taylor Parker. Remember when Taylor was trying to set up all of those businesses, trying to be a successful businesswoman? Well, I can only imagine that one of the businesses that she had set up was photography, wedding photography maybe. So she had photographed Reagan and Homer's wedding. So that is how Taylor and Reagan first met. And they had stayed friends on Facebook. So they weren't friends. They were more acquaintances. But they kept up with one another. They would like each other's posts. But you know how it is. You're not always friends with everyone on Facebook. And now in August of 2020, Reagan had some exciting news to share on social media. And that is that she was pregnant and she was already six months pregnant. They even announced that they were having a girl and they were going to name her Braxlyn Sage. And this is the post that Taylor saw that would completely change everything. So when Reagan posted on social media that she was pregnant, she got a ton of comments from people excited for her, congratulating her. And one of those people was Taylor. And Taylor was like, oh my God, this is so weird because I'm seven months pregnant as well. So we're basically in the same situation. So Taylor became obsessed with Reagan. She started taking her gifts. She was texting Reagan all the time. She wanted to be Reagan's best friend. So Taylor and Reagan, they started to become friendly. I wouldn't call them friends, but you know, they were friendly. So as the weeks pass, Taylor is getting closer and closer to her due date. And Taylor still is discussing all of the details of her pregnancy all over social media. And Taylor even starts making up loads of things about her pregnancy, saying that she's having complications, saying that her little baby girl, baby Clancy, she has a slow heartbeat. And doctors, they're slightly worried, but they think that she will be fine. And of course, she was getting a lot of messages of sympathy from people. People were genuinely worried about her. And of course, Taylor was loving all of this attention. However, there were still a lot of people that didn't even believe that she was pregnant. Wade's family being some of the people that didn't believe her. And Wade was getting really defensive. Every single time that a friend or a family member would bring up that they thought that Taylor was faking the whole thing, he would get into arguments. And Wade started falling out with his friends and his family, which is just so sad. He was saying things on social social media like a lot of you are going to feel very stupid in a few weeks when there is a baby here. And every single time Wade started to doubt Taylor a little bit, there would suddenly be a health scare with the baby and Taylor would get rushed to hospital. And this was just to manipulate Wade into not leaving. There was even one time where Wade received a text message from Taylor's ex, Tommy. 
Remember Tommy, he was the first relationship. So Tommy texts Wade saying, I know for a fact that Taylor is not pregnant because she's had a hysterectomy. So Wade confronted Taylor about this and Taylor blamed it on her evil mom. That's just her default, isn't it? She said that her evil mom was trying to intervene and ruin her life. So even more weeks pass and it is now October 2020, which is two weeks after Taylor's due date. So Taylor's due date was supposed to be the 22nd of September. We are now in October and people were saying to Wade, see, I told you so, she's not pregnant. So in early October, Wade being very concerned about Taylor and the baby, took Taylor to a clinic to get checked over to make sure that everything was okay. But of course, October 2020, still in lockdown, Wade couldn't go inside. So Taylor went into the clinic on her own. And this was actually the first time she even had gone to a clinic. Apart from that first time with Angela, right at the very beginning, Taylor had never been to a clinic because of course she wasn't pregnant. But Taylor had to go into the clinic because Wade was outside. So Taylor walks into the clinic wearing her fake baby bump. And I know what you're probably thinking, okay, so what the hell happens now? She's in a clinic with a fake baby bump. Surely her lies are going to be discovered. But unfortunately, no. Because as soon as Taylor gets into the clinic, she's waiting in the waiting room. And as soon as her name is called. She has a hysterical breakdown. She literally starts crying, panicking and saying, oh my god, no, 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 I can't do this. My husband, he's in the military and he's just died. No, 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 this is too traumatic. I have to leave. And she never went to her appointment. But of course, she went out to Wade and said, oh, everything's fine. Everything's great normal. She just said that she was going to be induced on the 5th of October. So a few more days pass and it is now October 5th, the day that she is supposed to be induced at the hospital. And before Taylor is induced, Wade is with his parents and his parents are giving him a very hard time about Taylor and they're saying things like, Taylor's not pregnant, there's going to be no baby born today. And Wade was getting so angry with his parents. And he was just so furious that his parents would even say this on the day that Taylor was going to get induced. So there was a huge argument. However, there is another twist to this story because Taylor, just before she's supposed to go to the hospital, the hospital got put on lockdown because of a bomb threat. I know, how much more can happen in this case? Which was very convenient for Taylor because she was now unable to get induced on October 5th. And this bomb threat, it pretty much shut down the whole hospital. Hundreds of patients had to get evacuated because of this bomb threat. It disrupted the whole day at the hospital. And if you're wondering, oh, well, that is a very strange coincidence. Why was there a bomb threat at this hospital? Well, Taylor phoned that in herself. It's unbelievable the lengths that this woman will go to. And I just get so angry at things like this because you're now disrupting a hospital. How many other people were giving birth on that day? were going in for operations, life-saving operations. How many other people were going to get induced on that day? And Taylor, because of her lies, she has just disrupted this whole day. However, Taylor blamed the bomb threat on her mom. Yep, she actually said to Wade, see, look, my mom wants to get me. She's out to get me. She wants to kill me. I know I have said this so many times in this case, but truly, I just cannot believe this. So now we get to the 8th of October. We are now way past Taylor's due date. There is no sign that she is booked in to be induced anytime soon. Something has got to give. And Taylor right now, she's panicking because she knows that there should be a baby by now. And Taylor had developed a very strange habit of sitting outside of pregnancy clinics, just watching pregnant women come and go, which is very sinister, very sinister indeed when you know what Taylor goes on to do. But as time passes, Taylor started to think to herself that the game was up. Now you would think at this point that Taylor would now fake another miscarriage. You would think that that would be the avenue that she would go down. However, Taylor knew that that was not an option for her because the reason that she was doing all of this was to keep Wade. And she knew if she had a miscarriage, Wade, he might stick around for a little bit after, but Wade, he didn't love Taylor. He was only staying with her because she was pregnant. So Taylor knew that she needed to get a baby. And this is when Taylor remembered her pregnant friend, Reagan Hancock. 
So on the evening of the 8th of October 2020, Taylor decided to pay her now close friend Reagan a visit. She bought gifts for the baby and also a Starbucks for Reagan and the two of them hung out all evening. They chatted, they had a really nice time and Taylor left. And Reagan posted on social media how nice it was to catch up with Taylor. However, unfortunately, after this evening, Taylor went back to Wade and she started planning the most sick and twisted evil plan that you will ever hear. Because this is when she decided that she was going to steal Reagan Hancock's baby. And this is now where we get to the absolutely heartbreaking, horrific events of today's case. So now we get to the 9th of October, the day after Taylor went over to meet Reagan. And it was this day that Taylor put her evil plan in place. She had now come up with a plan on how she was going to miraculously turn up with a baby. She told Wade that on the 9th of October, later on in the day, she was going to go to hospital again and be induced. But there was only one hospital that would take her and it was a hospital out of state. It was a hospital in Oklahoma. And this was actually legitimate. Taylor had phoned around all of the hospitals in the local area to try and get an appointment, but there was only one hospital that would take her at such last minute and it was a hospital in Oklahoma. However, Taylor told Wade that on the morning of her being induced, Wade needed to go out and make a business deal so he could earn them some money so they could afford the hospital bills. Well, remember that Wade's family is in the farming business and they have like a wild hog buying facility. Taylor had made a deal where someone was going to buy 150 hogs off Wade for $6,000. So on the morning of the 9th, Wade heads off to this mysterious business deal with 150 hogs in a trailer. But when Wade gets to this business deal, the business deal doesn't even exist. What a shocker. Wade had just driven 150 hogs across the country for no goddamn reason. And Wade was thinking, what the hell is going on? Why has Taylor sent me on a wild goose chase driving hundreds of miles across state lines? Why would Taylor do this? Taylor is being induced on that day. Surely Wade should be with her. Well, as you can probably guess, Taylor arranged this fake business deal to distract Wade, to get him out of the way so she could carry out her sinister plan. Because also on the morning of the 9th of October, Taylor was supposed to be waiting at home, relaxing, not getting too stressed, staying comfortable. But that is not what she did. Taylor had gotten into her car. She filled up the tank with gas. She picked up a little McDonald's breakfast and she made her way over to Reagan's house. Now we're going to skip forward a little bit here and sadly the worst has already happened. But everything happened so quickly now because at around 8 a.m. on the morning of the 9th of October, Reagan's husband Homer starts getting strange text messages from Reagan. And the messages were saying things like, this isn't working anymore. I don't want to be with you. I don't think we can make this work. And Homer was really confused because this did not sound like his wife. So he just responded to his wife, I love you. That was the only message that he sent and he just waited for his wife to respond. But then approximately another hour passes and it is now 9.30 a.m. Homer then receives a message from a neighbor saying that their puppy was loose and running around and also that the garage door was open. Now this made Homer panic because one, Reagan never went into the garage, so there is no reason why the garage would be open. Two, their puppy is running around. That would make anyone panic. But then three, Reagan was also sending those strange messages. So Homer was going into a panic. Homer was trying to contact friends, family, anyone to go over and check on Reagan. Anyone that was closer to Reagan than he was, he wanted them to go and check on her as soon as possible. And finally, Reagan's mom, Jessica, responded. And Jessica said, don't worry, I'll go check on my daughter. I'm sure everything's fine. So then Jessica goes over to the home. She sees that the garage door is open, but she also sees blood spots on the ground and also a bloody fingerprint on the front door. And Reagan's mom was absolutely terrified because anyone would be seeing blood outside of your child's home. I can imagine that she probably thought something was wrong with Reagan and her baby. So Reagan's mom went through the front door. She walked inside and she came across a horror scene. No parent should ever walk in 
on what Jessica walked in on because lying on the floor was her daughter, Reagan, and she was covered in blood. There was a pool of blood around her. So she immediately calls 911. Police arrive very quickly to the scene and Jessica is in hysterics. She is shouting, my daughter's dead, my daughter's dead. Now the police, when they arrive in the home, they hear a noise from another room. So they go and investigate and they find Reagan's three-year-old daughter, Kinley, in the next room. Reagan's three-year-old daughter was in the next room when the most horrific thing was happening to her mom. And the police are looking around this home and there's just so much blood everywhere. It's all over the walls, the floor, it's all in the kitchen. It's just everywhere. The paramedics soon arrive as well and they immediately rush over to Reagan. They try and frantically find a heartbeat, a pulse, but they can't find one. It was sadly too late. And when they inspect her body, she has so many wounds, bruises, cuts, defensive wounds all over her hands. One of her fingers was actually nearly hanging off. There were stab wounds. However, the most disturbing thing that the paramedics found was when they turned Reagan over, there was a large cut to her stomach. And when they investigated further, they found that Reagan's unborn baby, Braxlin Sage, was no longer there. The poor baby girl had been stolen from Reagan's womb. So the police launch an investigation, but it was pretty clear what had happened. Someone had broken into the house, attacked Reagan and stolen her baby. However, what the officers didn't realize is that on the other side of town, another strange incident had happened because a 27 year old woman had been pulled over by police because she was acting erratically. And this was Taylor Parker. Just before police arrived at Reagan's house, miles away from Reagan's home, Taylor Parker Parker was being followed by police because she was driving like a maniac. She was swerving all over the place. She nearly crashed into a truck. She nearly ran over a cyclist. And when police came up behind her, they put their sirens on for her to pull over. Taylor refused to pull over. Taylor even dialed 911 herself and told the operator on the phone that it was a medical emergency and that the police behind her should leave her alone. However, despite all of this craziness, after this car chase that sounds like it was from a movie, bloody hell, Taylor eventually pulls over and the police officer that approached Taylor's car, they were not expecting what they saw because they found Taylor with a newborn baby in her lap. There was blood everywhere and an umbilical cord was leading from the baby into Taylor's pants. And at this very moment, Taylor was performing CPR on this tiny newborn baby. And Taylor kept screaming, this is an emergency, this is an emergency. I need to get to a hospital. Taylor told the officer that she had given birth to her daughter at the side of the road. Paramedics were called and they arrived on the scene with Taylor very quickly. The baby was checked over, but the baby was not breathing. There was no heartbeat. And the paramedics were like, okay, we need to get this baby to the closest hospital. This baby needs immediate attention. But unbelievably, Taylor refused. She was like, no, 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 no. We cannot go to the nearest hospital. We have to go to my hospital, which is in Oklahoma. And don't ask me why she specifically wanted to go to this hospital in Oklahoma, because truly it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe she did want to be in another state, cross state lines. I just don't know. But Taylor was adamant that she wanted to go to this hospital in Oklahoma and the paramedics unbelievably gave in to what she wanted. So Taylor and the baby were rushed to the hospital in Oklahoma. And thankfully, the baby was resuscitated on the way to the hospital and there was a faint heartbeat. So eventually they arrive at the hospital and Taylor and the baby, they are rushed in. And I think at this point, Taylor Taylor truly thought that her evil plan was working. But no one would question her story on the fact that she had given birth at the side of the road. She was now in a hospital. Surely they would be able to save the baby and everything would be okay. However, that wasn't the case because the little baby girl was rushed into intensive care because she needed immediate attention and she was in a really bad way. However, doctors also wanted to look at Taylor because she had just given birth at the side of the road. They needed to check that she was over okay, that she wasn't going to hemorrhage. She had lost a lot of blood, but Taylor refused the examination. But doctors were insistent on the examination and Taylor had no option but to be examined. The doctors doing the examination could not believe 
what they found. First of all, they were shocked to find that the umbilical cord hadn't come from Taylor. Taylor also wasn't producing the hormones that she should be, given the fact that she was pregnant and just given birth. In fact, doctors also saw that she didn't even have a uterus. And there is actually video footage of this on YouTube. You can see the body cam footage of the police officers at the hospital talking to Taylor and Taylor having this examination and the doctors and everything. Sure. It's Taylor Parker. Taylor, hey, my name's Chad Sandsby. It's going to labor on the side of the road. Yeah, did you have a boy or a girl? A girl. A girl. Okay. Do you have a name yet? Clancy Gale. Clancy Gale. Check to check out, you know, any damage and check to make sure you're not bleeding inside internally. Well, that's okay. That's fine. I didn't know it was a big deal not to want the guy to do that. And the doctor that did the examination so bluntly came out and said, well, a baby definitely didn't come out of there. Oh, it surely doesn't look like a baby came out of there. Uh, it doesn't look like she had a baby. It doesn't? No. Okay. Does not look like she had a baby either. So the police go over to her bedside to try and figure out what happened. They said, Taylor, what happened? This baby is clearly not yours, so so care to tell us what happened? I'm just going to be upfront with you. We know that you had a hysterectomy sometime back and that you claimed to be pregnant for a while, but it really weren't. You didn't give birth this morning. What do you... What do you mean? So I just said you didn't get birth this morning. I just told y'all what happened. And initially Taylor was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That is my baby. But the police confront her that it was clear that the baby didn't come from her. So then Taylor, she breaks down. She starts crying. And pretty much at this exact moment, police got a report through about the murder of Reagan and about how her baby was cut from her womb. So police hearing that and seeing Taylor and Taylor now has a baby that clearly doesn't belong to her. They put two and two together and figure out that Taylor is behind the murder of Reagan. And this baby girl in the hospital belongs to Reagan. What we have is we have a dead woman down in Texas, and you took the baby out of. So the police confront Taylor with this information, and Taylor, she's still crying. I did not kill anybody. I didn't kill anybody. So was she alive when you left? I wasn't with any, I wasn't with her. But she's still lying. And her new story is that it was all an accident. You didn't mean to hurt her. Are you sad she's dead? She said things like, oh, it was, it was just an accident. I didn't mean for this to happen. Like, oh, I didn't mean for it to happen. She's a really bad actress, by the way. Really, really bad. She tried to say that she went over to visit Reagan. They had gotten into a heated argument over something and Reagan had pulled out a knife on Taylor. I remember pulling up. She grabbed the husband. We both hit each other. She had a knife though. Okay. Yeah, but I don't I did remember. I don't know why she grabbed it. I don't, I don't know why I would ever hurt her. Because I, I've never hurt anybody. Well, I can believe that. <laughs> I don't have a record. I, believe, I can believe that. There was some pushing and shoving going on, a little bit of a fight. And then Reagan fell over and fell onto her knife. And Taylor said that it was just a combination of self-defense and an accident. She fell with the knife because I shoved her. But then Taylor further goes on to say that Reagan, she's now just fallen onto her knife and Reagan is dying. And Reagan realizes that she's dying. So Reagan begs Taylor to cut out her baby and save her baby and take her baby for herself. And this is exactly what Taylor did. She was only acting on Reagan's wishes. Reagan asked her to perform a C-section. Reagan asked her to take her baby from her and take her for herself. To get the baby out. Did you have much trouble getting it up, cutting it open? Yeah. Okay. It fell out like she was pushing. Mm -hmm. it come out. Oh my God, I do question people so much. Did Taylor truly think that 
people were going to buy this. But the police, of course, they didn't. They had heard the report on Reagan's injuries. Reagan had so many defensive wounds. It was very clear that Reagan was the victim in all of this. And it didn't take long for police to find out that Taylor had been pretending to be pregnant for the last nine months because Taylor had been posting everything on social media. Why, why, why did you tell Reagan was pregnant? Yeah. Did you feel so police saw that as a huge motive but then the police also look at taylor's internet history and they found that in the last few days taylor had been searching for things like how to perform a c-section at 34 weeks which was the exact amount of weeks that reagan was pregnant Taylor even watched a video on how to perform a C-section. And don't forget, she got that job at the OBGYN's office and was uh, looking in on the surgical department on how to perform C-sections. So Taylor kind of already knew what to do. And at the scene of the crime, Reagan's body was found with a scalpel inserted into her neck. And police soon realized that Taylor had this scalpel herself and had brought it along to perform the C-section. And what is even more horrific and this Trudy. This actually broke me when I heard this, is that after performing an autopsy on Reagan's body, some of Reagan's own fingernails were found lodged into her own placenta, leading the police to conclude that Reagan was alive during Taylor performing the C-section and Reagan was still fighting for her baby as Taylor was performing the c-section as taylor was dragging her baby's body from her womb and that is just truly horrific that reagan knew what was happening that she was alive the whole time now only taylor knows exactly what happened in that room and taylor hasn't exactly come forward about what she has done but based on evidence at the scene and the injuries on reagan's body it is thought that taylor went over to the home they clearly got into an altercation very quickly but taylor had struck Reagan over the head with a jar, which caused blunt force trauma to her head. Reagan then fell to the ground and Taylor just began stabbing her. And it was then when Taylor had pulled out her scalpel, cut into Reagan's stomach and began to remove her baby whilst Reagan was still alive. And Reagan used all of the will left in her body to fight for her baby. And after Taylor had removed little baby Braxton Sage from the womb, it is thought that Taylor then stabbed Reagan in the neck with the scalpel. And this is how Reagan Hancock tragically lost her life. Taylor then fled from the scene and tried to make her way to the hospital. But obviously we know that she didn't and she was pulled over. Taylor was immediately arrested at the hospital and charged with first degree murder. And very sadly, we now need to talk about little baby Braxton Sage because Braxton was being treated in intensive care and she was resuscitated on the way to the hospital and she did have a faint heartbeat. And doctors did everything that they possibly could to save Braxton Sage's life. But tragically, at 1 p.m. on that afternoon, little baby Braxton Sage was pronounced dead. And I have no words for that. It's just beyond tragic. But what makes this even worse is that little little baby Braxton had died from a lack of oxygen and if she had been taken to a nearer hospital she may have been saved and that just makes this so much worse and the news broke in the community and as you can imagine it sent a tidal wave through so many people's lives. Taylor has destroyed so many people. Reagan's family were devastated. Her parents were devastated. Reagan's husband was devastated. Reagan's husband Homer was mourning his dead wife and his dead baby but also Reagan had a three-year-old daughter who has now lost her mother and we have to remember that her three-year-old daughter was in the next room as her mother was being murdered and Wade also found out what happened and I can't even imagine what he would have been thinking he possibly has a lot of guilt over what had happened 
So following her arrest, Taylor was held in jail. And then two years later, in September of 2022, she finally went to trial. And Taylor had the audacity to plead not guilty. She really thought that she could lie her way out of this once again. However, once the trial started, it became very clear that Taylor would not be able to get away with this. There was just too much evidence against her. Her whole web of lies, her whole story that she had been spinning all of these years came crashing down. And everything that we've talked about in this case came to light. Taylor's two ex-husbands, Tommy and Hunter, came forward to testify. Taylor's family came forward to testify, including Shona. And Shona obviously said that she wasn't evil, that she wasn't wealthy, that she had never put out a hit on her daughter. Wade also came forward to testify about everything that had gone on. And it was very clear to the prosecution that the murder of Reagan and her baby was premeditated. She knew exactly what she was doing. And do you remember that Taylor was sitting outside of pregnancy clinics watching pregnant women? Well, it turns out that Taylor was sat outside of pregnancy clinics and she was writing down the license plates of all of the pregnant women that she saw so she could find out where they lived to see if they would be a suitable victim for her, which, oh my God, is terrifying. The lengths that she was prepared to go to to steal a baby. But in the end, she chose Reagan as her victim. She murdered Reagan in the most cold and callous way imaginable. And truly, stealing Reagan's baby is one of the worst things I've ever heard. And Taylor's defense, they didn't really have much to say. And their closing arguments only lasted for 18 minutes, which is pretty short. And the prosecution's closing arguments lasted for about an hour. So I think that tells you everything. And then after less than 90 minutes, which again is incredibly quick, the jury had already decided that Taylor was guilty. And at her sentencing trial, Taylor Parker was sentenced to death, making her only the seventh woman and also the youngest woman on death row in Texas. And over a year later, Taylor still remains on death row. And oh my God, she has uh, caused some trouble in prison let's just say Taylor has done so much I truly do not have time to go through it all but she has gotten into so many fights with other inmates she has manipulated prison guards she has tried to become top dog in the prison she's entered into various other relationships with other inmates she is always in possession of contraband she also has been writing some very sexually suggestive letters to men on the outside and there is many more things that she has done as well but uh, let's just say she's not keeping a low profile. But I believe that she is exactly where she deserves to be. I truly have no words for Taylor. I, I really don't. Like, what do I say about Taylor? She is the epitome of evil. And I, I, I don't want to talk about her anymore. Like, I, I really don't. And I want to end this video focusing on the victims of today's case. Reagan Hancock was described as a sweet, caring, and loving young woman who had a beautiful soul and was a joy to all who knew her. She was an amazing wife, mommy, daughter, sister, and friend. She loved her young daughter, Kinley. Her and Homer were so excited about bringing baby Braxton Sage into the world, and she had so much ahead of her. She was only 21 years old. And then poor baby Braxton Sage. At the time of this incident, she weighed seven pounds, was only 18 inches long, and she had her whole life ahead of her. And it's just so sad that Braxton Sage never even got a chance to live the life that she deserved to live. But then we also have to talk about Reagan's daughter, Kinley, because she is also a victim in today's case because her mother was murdered. And I don't even want to think about what she possibly heard from that other room. And she was only three years old when her mother was murdered. But following this, Kinley was adopted by Homer who was Reagan's husband. And Homer is now raising Kinley as his own daughter. And truly, my heart goes out to both Homer and Kinley. And that brings us to the end of today's absolutely heartbreaking case. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. And don't forget to leave me your case suggestions down below. I just want to thank Mooncat again for sponsoring today's video. I will leave a link in my description box so you can go check out their Luna sale. And that is everything from me. So I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.